you know, this was originally going to be an in-person uh, talk uh, in London, but unfortunately I had to come to the U.S. this week, although it was for a good reason. I was actually just on the, the Joe Rogan podcast uh, in Austin, Texas, which will be released today. So if you guys are interested, uh, check that out. The focus of that was more on the simulation hypothesis, although I did mention manage to talk about Yogananda a little bit uh, in that interview. And so, you know, our topic today uh, is... Uh, Wisdom of a Yogi, and the subtitle is Lessons for Modern Seekers from Autobiography of a Yogi. <laughs> and so just some background, uh, Yogananda came over to the U.S. Uh, almost 100 years ago from India, and he was one of first. the first uh, Indian gurus to not just visit America, uh, which you know Swami Vivekananda had done uh, in the 1800s, uh, but also to make uh, the U.S. his home. And as a result, he traveled really all over uh, the United States, uh, crisscrossing the country on trains and automobiles. They didn't really have uh, passenger planes at, at that point. Uh, and as such, you know, he, he was one of the first to really introduce the idea of yoga and uh, Eastern uh, concepts such as karma, meditation, samadhi. Uh, you know, all of these different aspects of yoga, uh, the eight limbs of yoga, uh, all into uh, the Western consciousness. But he often would tailor uh, the stories that he told so that they could be digested, you know, by uh, a Western audience. Uh, and so uh, he wrote uh, this book in 1946, I believe it was published, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi. And it became, you know, not just a, a bestseller, it became really a cultural touchstone in the 1960s uh, and 1970s. So during kind of, I guess you'd say the hippie generation, uh, it, there was a paperback version that was passed around and it became one of the most passed around books of that generation. Uh, and, you know, every now and then I'll, I'll talk to someone who was in San Francisco in the Haight-Ashbury district, for example, uh, during the summer of love which was, I think, 1968 or so. And they'll say, yeah, you know, we had this, you know, this orange paperback copy of Autobiography of Yogi, and we would just pass it around from one person to the next. Uh, and so uh, it, it became really one of the, the defining books of that generation and their interest uh, in Eastern spirituality. Now, Yogananda himself had, had passed away by then uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and so he wasn't around to see kind of this huge success of his book, but that really became his legacy. And for many people, it was an introduction to the ideas. And so if you read Autobiography of a Yogi, which some of you have done, you'll see that it's really a series of stories, stories from Yogananda's own life, but also stories from his gurus and his guru's guru's life. Uh, and, you know, some of the stories can be quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, you have levitating saints, uh, you have bilocating saints. You have uh, immortal, supposedly immortal beings living in the Himalayas. You have objects appearing and disappearing, astral objects. You have tele telepathy happening over hundreds of miles. So, and, and these stories are told in such a casual way that it almost seems like, oh yeah, this stuff happened all the time, you know, back then. Uh, but even when he wrote this book, uh, things were already changing, and India was modernizing uh, at, in in the you know the first half of, of the twentieth century. So what happened was that a few years ago, uh, on the 75th anniversary of Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, HarperCollins India wanted to do a, an update of the book, and they wanted to make it more relevant to modern readers. And so they asked me uh, if, if I would write a, a book about the lessons that I've learned from uh, Swami Yogananda, but also from you know, general yogic philosophy uh, from the perspective of somebody who's been an entrepreneur, a businessman and now an academic uh, and uh, to try to see if we can fit these in. Now, some of you may know that I wrote a book called The Simulation Hypothesis, which is a book about the idea that the world that we live in um, is really an illusion, uh, but looking at it, not from the old Eastern perspective, but from the modern perspective, uh, that uh, the world is a, a type of computer simulation or a type of hoax or a type of massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And so, you know, one of the things they wanted me to do was to kind of look at these stories from somebody who's familiar with modern technology. And if you look at all the scriptures of the world, uh, 
right, going back thousands of years, they always speak in metaphors. Why? Because oftentimes the thing that they're describing is ineffable. Right? That means it's difficult to put into words. Uh, and so they have to come up with a way of describing it that people, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago uh, would understand. Uh, and so they, they often use metaphors. Uh, and so you can view the idea that the world is a video game as a modern metaphor of this. So anyway, they asked me if I would write the book. And, you know, at first I was like, well, are you sure you don't want, um, you know, somebody who's a, who's a, a full time Swami. Uh, but I, I took on the task and uh, we published it uh, last year. Uh, and the book w was published with uh, the full support of the Self-Realization Found Foundation, which was Yogananda's organization that he established in the U.S. And then there are branches of that in the U.K. and in India as well. Uh, and, you know, uh, they actually uh, uh, spent a lot of time with me to so that I could, uh, you know, find out more about Yogananda's, li Yogananda's life. And I'll, I'll tell you about you know, some of those stories in a minute. So in any case, that's how, you know, this particular book uh, uh, came about. Uh, and so, you know, one of the questions, though, was what should we as modern readers think about these stories of these miracles and these kind of miraculous happenings that, that like I said, happened, you know, almost like as if they happened to Yogananda all the time, right? Um, and, uh, you know, should we think these are just allegories? Uh, of course, those who are more devout would think, okay, you know, we, we have to go by the letter of these stories um, and that everything happened just, just the way that it's described, although Yogananda didn't necessarily see everything. Uh, the more scientific-minded today would say, well, these are teaching stories. They are meant to interest and excite you, um, uh, you know, about the idea of yoga. And his audience was a Western audience. So he needed to present, you know, this very unfamiliar philosophy at the time uh, in a way that people would understand. Now, there's also no techniques pretty much in the book, right? The book is just stories. And, and, and that's actually what's made it kind of unique in a way, in, in, in the spiritual canon of at least the Eastern uh, you know, yogic traditions in the West, uh, is that even though he's trying to advocate for a specific type of, uh, of yoga or Kriya Yoga that he taught in his organization, most of the millions of people who read the book, you know, it, it was really just a way for them to get inspired and then go find whatever their practice might be, right? Uh, the Beatles, uh, you know, had uh, spent some time with uh, uh, the, the Maharishi in, in Rishikesh, and uh, George Harrison was a huge fan of this book. In fact, he would have copies of it, of Autobiography of a Yogi, and he would give it out you know, to anybody he felt needed regrooving. Um, and another notable figure who, who was a huge fan of this book was Steve Jobs. So some of you may know Steve Jobs, you know, before he started Apple, was a bit of a, a, a mystic and a wanderer. And he went to India. And he went to India to try to find uh, this one guru uh, whose name is Neem Karoli Baba, who became famous uh, because of Ram Das, who had gone there and given him some LSD. Uh, and, you know, uh, the Baba said, here, give me, give me those pills. And he took all 10 of them. And the people were like, oh, my God, he's going to, you know, these are psychedelics. He's going to start acting really weird. And, and Neem Karoli Baba goes, ah, and then they were all worried. And then he started laughing and he goes, Kujanehoya, meaning, which means in, in, in Hindi, you know, nothing happened, really. And so that was part of Ram Das's conversion from Richard Alpert, who was a Harvard professor. So in, in any case, you know, he was kind of a famous guru at that time. So Steve Jobs went to India to try to find him, but Neem Karoli Baba had already passed away, right? We didn't have the internet back in the 70s uh, to know, you know, what was going on. And so what happened was in his, in his hostel room, somebody had left a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And so mostly he started reading these stories about these gurus and wandering around India reading Autobiography of a Yogi. And then when he came back to the U.S., uh, he would read it every year. And if you read Steve Jobs' uh, biography by Walter Isaacson, there's a scene in there in 2011, I think, just after the iPad was released, when he went to Steve Jobs' house. And the only book on the iPad was Autobiography of a Yogi. And then when Steve Jobs passed away uh, at his funeral service, uh, his memorial service, at, which was held at Stanford University, everyone received a little brown box. And in that box, when they went home and opened it, there was a copy of Autobiography of Yogi. And this has a, become a famous story on the internet because Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce.com, you know, told the story very publicly because he was actually there. Um, 
And so anyway, this book has influenced a lot of different figures, you know, over the years. But again, should we think of it as allegory or not? And so for me, you know, one of the more fun parts of the book was to look at these stories of, of miracles uh, that happened uh, and to draw some lessons from those. Uh, but before we get into the miracles, so one of the first lessons that I draw out in, in, in my book, so my book is a series of 14 lessons. And it's interesting because I, I met with the uh, some of the board members of the Self-Realization Fellowship who, you know, when my book finally came out and they were reading it and they said, well, this is great because we just read Autobiography of Yogi as kind of a spiritual text, but we don't always think about what are the lessons in the stories. Um, and so, uh, you know, when Yogananda was young, he had this vision when he was like eight years old while uh, he was meditating. He was a bit of a prodigy that way. And he saw uh, these uh, the mountains, the Himalayas, and he saw, you know, these guys that looked like monks. And he said, who are you? And they, in his vision, and they said, we are the yogis of the Himalayas. And suddenly he had this revelation that that's what he wanted to do. He had a flash. And he, from that point forward, he always envisioned himself as being a wandering monk in the Himalayas. Uh, and at, at, even at eight years old, he tried to run away to the Himalayas. Of course, he was too young. And his older brother, Ananta, you know, would work with his father to kind of bring him back. Uh, and then there's so many colorful tales where he decides to run away. And one of them, you know, he and his friends when he was in high school uh, end up uh, basically, you know, taking a, taking, a, taking a bag of stuff, sneaking over to the train station, putting on Western clothes. And, and, and his dad worked for the railway, so they were trying to get up to the Himalayas. And so you have this colorful scene of, uh, you know, of his... Um, uh, of his older brother chasing him across northern India from Calcutta, where he lived, you know, up to, I think, Hardwar is where they were trying to get. And this, you know, one of the boys got scared because of the stories of tigers in the Himalayas. And in any case, you know, they were able to bring him back and get him to promise that that he wouldn't leave until after high school. Um, now, what, what what's interesting about all this is that he left as soon as he graduated from high school uh, to try to join some ashram in Benares. Uh, but in the end, he discovered his guru, uh, who he met in Benares, but turns out he lived in, in Sarampore, which was only like 12 miles from Calcutta. So it was only about 12 miles away from, uh, you know, where, uh, where Yogananda had grown up. And so, you know, he had this, this vision in his mind of where he might go and be a wandering monk. But really, he found, you know, the spiritual tradition uh, that he became a part of actually was closer to home. And it turns out his guru, Sri Yukteswar, and his parents were kind of brother disciples in that they were both disciples of Lahiri, uh, Lahiri Mashai, who is, is how he's addressed here. Uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, it was all part of his family tradition. So here he spent his life trying to run away. Uh, and I think what happens to us in life is we often have these visions of what our life might look like. But we don't always get the specifics right. So Yogananda did, in fact, become uh, a wandering monk. And he probably wandered you know, more than most monks, you know, going back to the time of Shankara, you know, uh, way back 1,200 years ago, whenever, whenever he was around. Who, but he wandered around on foot in India. Yogananda wandered around, as I said earlier, on trains and automobiles. And so he probably logged more miles than you know, most uh, most wandering monks, uh, but but he had the specifics wrong, and I think sometimes we have a flash of insight, which is our karmic story, right? We have this sense of what we might want to do. Like if you had asked me in high school uh, what I was going to do, I would say I would have told you, well, I'm going to be a computer entrepreneur, programmer, entrepreneur, and then I'm going to be a writer. Uh, but I said I was going to do switch at the age of 28 because I thought that was old back then <laughs> when I was in high school or even in college. And, you know, it turned out that the general idea was correct, but the timing was off, right? I didn't actually become a full-time writer, even though I did start writing my first book at 28. I didn't become a full-time writer until, you know, much later. And if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll tell that story a bit later uh, because of uh, some of the setbacks uh, that, both Yogananda encountered and, and that I've encountered and that each of you have made me encounter at some point in your life. But again, the message is, you know, Steve Jobs went all the way to India looking for a guru. But in the end, you know, he just got this English book that was published in America first, right? And that became a key part of, of his, his spiritual tradition. In the book, I tell the story of 
of Peter, who who was a, a Hollywood producer. He lived in L.A. And again, he went all the way to Rishikesh. He'd go there every year or so, you know, looking for a spiritual teacher, a guru. And what happened? He, he walked into a bookstore in Rishikesh and he saw a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And, you know, he's like, well, that guy looks familiar. He had actually seen a picture of him, I guess, back in the U.S. Uh, and then he ended up coming back and realizing, you know, that there was teachers of that tradition like very close to his home in Hollywood, the Hollywood Temple. And so, uh, you know, there's this idea that we have to run away, we have to go somewhere else. Uh, and, and I certainly had that that idea in my mind as well. But oftentimes, you know, what's closest to home um, is, I, I think, where we may find, uh, you know, a, a lot of value. So that's, you know, one of the lessons is, is you don't need to go to the Himalayas. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, I want to tell a couple of stories about the miracles uh, that are described in the book. And there's quite a few of them. Uh, and so there's a whole section in Wisdom of a Yogi where I go through, um, you know, the various uh, superpowers, as I like to call them, or as they were called in the yogic traditions, the cities, right? Um, and so you find again and again uh, this idea of bilocation. Uh, that comes up as well as levitation uh, and objects appearing and disappearing. And what I found, though, sometimes was that um, these stories also involved an element of karma. And so oftentimes what Yogananda is trying to teach us uh, is an actual lesson. And so whether you take the stories uh, completely uh, at face value or you take the, the stories as more of an allegory, in either case, you can still derive from lessons. So let me tell you the story about the genie that appears uh, in Yogananda, right? And so there's a story about a Muslim fakir right, named Afzal Khan, who, when he was younger, helped out a yogi by giving him some water. And this took place in the 1800s sometime. Uh, and this story was told to Yogananda by his guru, Sri Yukteswar, whom he believed unconditionally, and Yukteswar actually witnessed Afzal Khan. And so what happened with Afzal was uh, this yogi taught him a technique that he practiced where he could have control over an entity. Now, Yogananda doesn't say exactly what that entity was, but it was called Hazrat. And given the Islamic undertones of the story, uh, it was probably what we, you know, what in the Islamic traditions would be called a jinn or a genie. Right? And so what happened was that Afzal Khan got this ability because of some good karma in his past life. But the teacher warned him, okay, but you also have a tendency towards greediness, toward avariciousness. And he said, be careful. And so the, the guru went away. Afzal Khan eventually mastered the technique. So he had this entity called Hazrat, and he started to misuse it because he could tell Hazrat to take an object. So he would go to a jewelry store, and he would touch the jewelry and then he'd go outside and he'd tell Hazrat, give me that jewelry. And the jewelry would disappear and eventually it would appear in his hands. Uh, and then he would go to the ticket, you know, the train station, because he had a bunch of followers and he would like touch the tickets. But then he would say, OK, I don't want to buy them. He'd go away and then he'd tell Hazrat and Hazrat would make them appear and disappear. So they could never accuse him of actually stealing these objects since no one actually saw him stealing these objects. But he began to be known as the terror of Bengal. And so Yogananda's guru actually met Afzal Khan in the same dormitory where Yogananda was staying when, when he went to college, reluctantly, because he just wanted to be a monk. Um, uh, but and in, in, that, in that episode, uh, he saw Afzal Khan perform a number of miracles, right? including he threw a stone into, into the Ganges, came back, Afzal had Hazrat retrieved the stone that had the writing on there. Uh, he saw a huge feast being uh, materialized out of nowhere from the ceiling that came down, you know, huge biryanis and golden plates and bowls. Uh, they had this giant feast. Uh, and then they, you know, basically, boom, Havzat took everything away. And so, you know, this, this sounds like an interesting story. Uh, and then what happened later, they found out was that Afzal Khan was uh, walking somewhere and he saw this kind of lame old man who had a uh, who had a ball of gold and the, the lame old man said you know you you seem like you're a yogi maybe you can help fix my my uh, you know my leg and Afzal just kind of laughed at him he touched the gold uh, the gold ball walked away told Hazrat to get it and the ball disappeared 
and it ended up in Afzal's hands. And then suddenly he looked and the, 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 the crippled old man was not crippled and turns out it was the same yogi who had taught him the technique uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, that had taught him how to control Hajra in the first place. And he said, you clearly have been misusing this ability, right? And so I'm going to take away uh, your ability to control Hazrat because you used it for selfish purposes, right? But you do have some good karma, so I will allow you to still use Hazrat to, uh, uh, you know, to get some food or clothing if you need it. And so in this case, he actually issued an apology in a Bengali newspaper where he told this whole story and that was how Yukteswar and then his friends knew about it. And then they told Yogananda. Well, okay, so what do we make of this story? Right? I mean, did this really happen? Were objects materializing and dematerializing or not? And I would say, well, one, you know, part of, uh, part of my research for this book included talking to a lot of professors of religion. And they said that what happens in academia uh, and even you know, people who study religion is they might believe in these things initially. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but they are socialized to basically treat them as social stories, nothing more than stories. Uh, but then I, I interviewed this professor uh, from the University of North Carolina, Diana Pasolka, who studies Catholicism. And she says, as she looked into the Catholic traditions, she found numerous examples of saints doing the same kinds of things, you know, that Yogananda describes, right, including Joseph of Cupertino, who a thousand people witnessed uh, going up into the sky. And actually, Yogananda even writes about that. And so she came to the conclusion that even though she had been socialized uh, to not believe this stuff, that it's very possible that P Yogananda was describing real events. Now, whether he was describing real events or not, this is actually a story about karma, believe it or not, as are many of his stories. And so uh, if you think about Afzal Khan, and if you think of the world as a video game, and in this play, in this character, Afzal Khan, you need to make a test for that character. And the test says, will you give in to your greed or will you finally go to your better nature and help other people? And that's the test that you want to give to this person. Well, what better way than to give him a magical genie <laughs> that can get any object he desires, any material possession, right? I mean, there's, there's almost no better test. It's almost an irresistible test, if you will. And so in, in a sense, this story was about the karmic test that Afzal Khan had in this life. Uh, and he failed the test initially, at least, right? And then we, when he realized he was with the guru again. And, and so, so that's an example that brings out some of the subtle aspects of karma, uh, which, you know, we often think of in the West as, uh, you know, somebody killed me, I killed them. We do the same thing. But there's a couple of stories from uh, in Yogananda's book about his tradition uh, and uh, what he, who he, uh, this figure he calls the Maha Avatar Babaji, uh, who supposedly even up to you know the current times has been living in the mountains uh, in the Himalayas for literally hundreds and hundreds of years and supposedly also initiated Shankara and Kabir, the great Muslim Hindu poet uh, back in the 15th century. And then in the 18th century, in 18th, uh, the 19th century in 1861, uh, he met Lahiri Mahashai, uh, who was uh, the guru of Yogananda's guru's guru. And there's a couple of stories there that, again, seem pretty miraculous. But again, I mean, it's okay if we take them literally, but there's an element of karma here, I think, that's really important to understand. And so a lot of the lessons in these miracles delve into that. So when uh, Lahiri was summoned to Raniket, which is kind of in the middle of the mountains, he had to take a little horse and buggy, and it took him a month to get out there. Uh, to this accounting office for the government and he had nothing to do so he started wandering around in the mountains because there was actually no work for him to do there and one day this this young man who looks like he was 25 years old shows up and says Lahiri there you are I have summoned you you're finally here and Lahiri is like who, who the heck are you I don't remember you because don't you remember I was your I'm your guru from the previous life here's the cave where you used to meditate here's the you know here's the blanket where you used to meditate uh, and the Hiri's like, no, I don't remember any of it. And he goes, well, I've been keeping a watch on you, uh, and we're going to initiate you into Kriya Yoga. So he then, you know, gives him some oil, does like an initiation, 
he start Lahiri starts to remember his previous lives. But then he says, we have a special treat for you. So when Lahiri comes out of the cave to do the actual initiation ceremony, suddenly there's a golden palace that has been materialized out of nothing uh, in, the, in the middle of the Himalayas or at the foothills, right, where Raniket is. Uh, and there's this shining light. And Lahiri is amazed. He's like, wait, how did you do that? And Babaji says, well, this is a dream palace, right, that I've created for you that looks like it's real because the whole world is a dream. And so the metaphor of the dream is kind of an important one that gets used in, in the traditions. Uh, and it, what happened was in a previous life, you expressed a very strong desire uh, to live in a palace. Uh, and in order to resolve that karma, right, you actually would have to have a whole life living as like a prince in a palace. But by creating this palace here for you for during this initiation ceremony, we've basically resolved that karma so that you don't have to worry about it anymore, right? And so from that perspective, uh, you know, it was a story about karma. And then after the initiation was done, which took all night, you know, some food showed up from nowhere and then the whole palace disappeared and he was just in the mountains again. Now, some people accuse Yogananda of, you know, taking the story from the Arabian Nights. And if any of you have ever read the story of Aladdin, uh, maybe you've seen the movie or the cartoons, um, you know, there's in the actual original book story, you know, there's palaces like this being materialized. But so the real point here is not just that there was a, a palace, but one, that there's this idea that the whole world is a dream world. So that's a powerful metaphor. But two, it's the idea that karma comes from our strong desires, right? And within the Tibetan traditions, they talk about little karma or karmic traces and bigger karma. And what happens with everyday karmic traces, these are things that make an impression on you, whether it's a desire or revulsion or reaction, but something that makes a mental impression on you. And sometimes they show up in our dreams. Like, have you ever had that happen where if you watch a movie and later that night there's a scene from the movie in your dream, that's what the Tibetans call a karmic trace. What it's showing is in the dream, you can resolve that karmic trace so it doesn't go into, say, the big karmic database that's out there. But karma can, comes up in many different ways. Um, and, and part of that is our you know, strong desires. And clearly, in this case, the desire was strong enough uh, for, you know, for uh, Babaji to basically say, okay, this is a, a real karmic desire. And so uh, there's another story about Babaji uh, who was up in the mountains uh, and uh, they were sitting around a fire and suddenly he gets up with one of the, the logs from the fire and he like strikes one of the students on the shoulder and burns him. And Lahiri was there and he, Lahiri says, you know, sir, how cruel, how could you do that to your own student? And Babaji explains, well, his karmic, his karma dictated that he would have to die and suffer in a horrible fire. But by giving him the suffering, in this specific shoulder, I have resolved that karma and he doesn't have to go about that, right? And so that's yet another subtle definition of karma. Uh, but what, what all of this is getting at is that, you know, our karmic traces, our karmic information goes with us, you know, in, in across lives. Uh, and it gets resolved in either the dream world when we're dreaming or in the dream world of reality. Now, I mentioned that the dreams was one of the uh, the biggest metaphors and the term Maya uh, usually translates to illusion. Right? But if you really look into it, Maya actually means more than just an illusion. It's also the force of the gods by which you are deluded. And it's also considered a carefully crafted illusion. And, you know, one of the, the references that I found that I think puts a better uh, spin on it is that it's like if you go to a magic show, and if you go to a magic show, you know the magician on stage is just performing illusions. And you know, if you've ever seen, you know, them saw the woman in the box in half, you know he's not really sawing the woman in half. Uh, but you you suspend your disbelief. Because why? Because that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it enjoyable. You have to immerse yourself in that illusion. And, you know, Yogananda was looking at some uh, film footage from World War I, uh, which, as some of you know, is called the Great War. Uh, 
and the, it was one of the first mechanized wars. And so there was more death and destruction than really almost any war before, which is why you know, it was called the Great War. And he saw these scenes of suffering and he was meditating and then he saw these scenes and he started crying at the amount of suffering and he asked, Lord, why do you allow this? And so while he was meditating, he got this insight. Uh, and this insight was what he used as an updated metaphor for the 20th century. And he used the latest technology of the 20th century to try to describe it. And the metaphor he got was, look at the film screen, at the film projector, right? When you have a film, the characters are dying and they're suffering, but the actors are not really suffering. And so if you view the whole world uh, as a kind of film, uh, then you have a better sense of what Maya is all about. And so Yogananda used to tell his students, you are looking at a film screen, look away, look at the projector, look at the light that's coming from the projector. And so part of the technique of meditation was is to turn away from the illusion of Maya. And so he used you know, this updated metaphor. Uh, and if you've ever been in a movie theater and you're engrossed in the movie, but then you look away, and you realize everybody else is like completely engrossed in the movie, but you see the flickering of the frames, right? Which lets you know that this is actually an illusion. And Yogananda talked about the whole world being light. Well, if he were alive today in the 21st century, in the 2020s, right, rather than the 1920s, I believe he would say it's like a movie where all the actors, but we're also the audience. We have a script, but we can change the script. Uh, we can make free will. Uh, what does that sound like? Today, it sounds like a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, right? And so that's why I use the metaphor. Uh, and in, in one of the lessons in the book is that the world is a, a dream, a movie, and a video game. But the video game for me is the ultimate metaphor because it's something we all understand uh, today, particularly younger, younger readers. Uh, but also the idea that in a video game, you have an avatar that you are playing, right? just like in The Matrix. By the way, this year is the 25th anniversary of The Matrix. Um, and, and so, you know, I just wrote an article for CNN recently about that. But, you know, it's a very religious film uh, with this idea. If you, if you kind of ignore the, uh, you know, the aliens that are enslaving humans, but you, you say that the whole world looks real, but it's actually a kind of simulation. Uh, and that superpowers you know, come from those who are able to recognize that it's all an illusion. So anyway, those are some of the lessons in the book. There, there's a number of others. Uh, I, I think I'm running out of time here, but you know, sometimes you read Yogananda's book and you think, oh my God, this guy lived the charmed life. You know, he would ask for some divine mother for something and he would just get it. But if you look at his life story, you realize he had significant challenges and setbacks. And those challenges and setbacks were really important. And maybe I'll get into some of that in the Q&A. Uh, but why don't I leave it there? I, I did want to mention that uh, Watkins in London does have uh, signed copies of, of four of my books. Uh, the Simulation Hypothesis, The Simulated Multiverse, Wisdom of a Yogi, and then Treasure Hunt, which was my book about synchronicity and follow the clues, following the clues, which uh, is another lesson in Wisdom of a Yogi, which is all about how to use your intuition. Uh, Lahiri, who was who was Yogananda's guru's guru, used to say that man's capacity for getting into trouble is unlimited, but so is his capacity for using his intuition and guidance uh, from the soul level to get out of that trouble, <laughs> right? And so part of why we meditate is to learn to quiet the mind, to learn to perceive the world, but also uh, to try to tap into our intuition. So Lahiri would say intuition is soul guidance. Uh, and that's an important part, I think, of how we can navigate through life in a different, less materialistic way, but also realizing our karmic script. Uh, so why don't I, I, I stop there for now and, you know, we can open it up for questions and I can also, you know, tell some other stories as well. If we have time. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it definitely has because, you know, for me, the idea that the world is a simulation has brought together many different threads uh, in my life. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the video game industry. I spent a lot of time in academia with scientists. Uh, 
I spent time with, you know, Buddhist meditation groups, with shamanic dream practitioners and journeying practitioners. Uh, and I've tried a lot of different meditation techniques myself. Uh, and and I, I found that uh, by using the metaphor of the video game, we can bring ourselves, you know, first of all, I can bring all these threads together and you can talk in the scientific world and you can talk in the spiritual world, you know, about the same ideas by using this one metaphor. But for me personally, I think it's it's helped, you know, I mean, I have very, I have very spiritual pra practices uh, that I've picked up over the years. Now, in the book, uh, I talk about, you know, all the different types or, or many of the different types of spiritual practices that are out there and the river of yoga, uh, because, you know, there are so many different variations of these practices. Uh, and if you go back to Patanjali's uh, Yoga Sutras, if you look at the definition of yoga in that, he says, you know, yoga chitta vritti naroda. And what that means in Sanskrit is yoga is the cessation or the stopping of the chitta vrittis. And what does that mean exactly? And so there are different translations of this, right? It doesn't say yoga is the asanas uh, or that yoga is a particular type of meditation. Uh, it's that it is any practice that lets you stop these vrittis in the chitta. And the vritti literally tra translates as whirlpool. And most uh, you know, translators translate chitta as mind stuff. And so you get these weird translations that don't translate well into English. Even Yogananda says, you know, yoga, he translates Patanjali as yoga is the fluctuations of uh, the waves of the mind, um, as the stilling of the fluctuations of the frequencies of the mind. And so there are a lot of different definitions out there. But I've tried to bring that definition forward, you know, to more of a a modern, uh, a modern sensibility in English. And so I said, you know, yoga is the cessation of the whirlpools of thoughts and feelings in the river of consciousness, right? Because the vrittis are these little things that happen when we think about things, when we desire things, and when we have feelings. A lot of times when this stuff gets translated from Sanskrit or from Pali and Buddhism or from Tibetan, it gets translated only as sort of mind but really, it's about mind and emotions because the emotions create the vrittis. The vrittis are like in our, our energy fields, our kosas. They harden. They become samskaras, uh, which then are part of our karmic uh, database, if you will. They turn into vasanas, which are tendencies across different lives. And so it always begins there. So yoga is any practice, you know, which which stops that. And so so for me... This idea that the world is a is an illusion or a video game uh, is pretty important because as I've gone through some uh, some situations and when I meditate, part of what I'm trying to do is separate from the character that is Rizwan and to remember the part of me that was planning this life, right? And so when you plan a video game, you choose your character. And when I was a kid, we used to have like Dungeons and Dragons, where you'd have a character sheet and you would say, I'm going to be an elf and my profession is going to be a wizard. And you roll the dice and you have all these different characteristics, strength, agility, uh, you know, intelligence, charisma, and you roll the dice and you get all these. And to, in, in, the same, in the same way, I believe we choose our character here in this life. Uh, and we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. And mostly we also have our challenges. We have our lessons that we're here to learn and the challenges. So a key part of my spiritual practice, you know, is not just to do, uh, so I do a particular type of meditation, which is a chakra meditation, which is actually very close to the Kriya techniques that Yogananda, uh, you know, teaches, um, but which I learned beforehand. And then later when I was learning about Kriya, it turns out it was very similar. Um, but for me, it's also about realizing that this story uh, and, and this is, you know, one of sort of a more of a Raja Yoga technique, realizing that this whole story is like a theater. It's like a game. Um, and uh, you can actually step back from that and say, OK, you know, I plan to do X, Y, Z. Uh, now, how far did I get, you know, with X, Y, Z? What happened along the way that may have pushed me off course? Uh, so so anyway, it it does play you know, into my spiritual practice, but most often it also plays into, you know, how I make decisions about the world. 
uh, because you know one of the things that I talk about in, in both this book and the simulation book is that near-death experiencers report something called the life review. And the life review, uh, you know, people who've had a near-death experience, like this one guy, Daniel Brinkley, who was struck by lightning, he wrote a book called Saved by the Light, it was a huge bestseller back in the 90s. He said he had to go through every single moment of his life, but he had to do it in a holographic, three-dimensional, panoramic life review, right? And so he played back everything, but he had to experience it not as himself, but as the other people and how he treated those people. And so he was a bit of a bully when he was younger and he used to beat other kids up. And then he joined the military. And in Vietnam, he literally killed people, right? He shot people. And he had to experience what it was like to be shot by himself. And then he had to see the ripple effects on that person's wife and kids from not having, you know, their, their father and husband around. And so, you know, it was a replaying of all that. And now as a computer scientist, I asked myself, well, if it's being replayed, it has to be recorded somewhere, right? Uh, and that's what you know gets into this idea that in a video game, you can record a gameplay session and then you, you can replay it. In fact, this happens on YouTube. You know, the most popular content on YouTube is actually video game content. Like you're watching a recording of somebody playing a video game talking about it. And so, you know, the life review, I think, helps us to understand what the purpose of the game is. And, you know, I also talk about other spiritual traditions and it turns out in the Islamic traditions, there is this idea of the scroll of deeds. And the scroll of deeds is uh, a kind of a list of everything you've done in your life. And there's these two angels, the Kiram and Kitabin, who, one of whom writes down all your good deeds and one of whom writes down your bad deeds. And in the Quran, you know, not only are there verses that say that, this world is a game, it's a pastime, it's a sport. We have set it up for you. But also says that the world is a delusion. He uses a specific Arabic word, al garuri which as I understand it, actually means like an enjoyable delusion. It's like a game that you set up for yourself. Even though, as Yogananda pointed out, the nature of this world is not ceaseless joy, right? There's a lot of suffering in this world. It's, you know, every day you take what Yogananda called you know, the warp and woof of Maya, right? But at the same time, that's what makes the game rich. Um, and, and so I keep in mind the life review because of how I treat other people. You know, those are the important things in the game. That's how you win points, not by doing Grand Theft Auto and stealing things or not even by making money in Silicon Valley from what people who have been on the other side, you know, uh, have told us. Um, and And so... That leads to, to, to the next uh, way in which I think this makes a difference in my life, which is that uh, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it is that uh, uh, when we experience difficulties and challenges in life, right, that we can think of those as quests in a video game, right? And you may not always be able to achieve the quest the first time. And sometimes you may decide to take on a very difficult quest. And so it changes our perspective to maybe we agreed to this particular difficult situation, or maybe this quest is going to lead us to something afterwards. Rather, And the quest in this difficult situation could be a health problem, financial problems, relationship problems, family problems, you know, physical problems, disasters, war, all of these things that are, as Yogananda said, you know, the nature of this world, this physical world, uh, you know, uh, the, what he called the beatings of the world, right? <laughs> said you have to meditate to get back into a good state before you're ready for the beatings of this world again. But if you shift your perspective and say, I may have actually decided at some level that part of me that's watching the game to decide this is a good quest or a side quest, or maybe it's getting us on a different direction. Now, I'll give you an example. So Yogananda you know, he traveled all through the 1920s and part of the 1930s, but he had a huge set of setbacks. Uh, and in one case, you know, there's a scandal involving his number two guy, Swami Dirananda, who I guess was teaching a class in LA while Yogananda was out traveling. And, uh, you know, some, it was many women were taking the class, which even today, right, you have many women in yoga classes. Uh, and this husband of the woman thought something untoward was going on and he came and he hit Swami Dirananda punched him in the nose. 
And it started what we would call a viral story today, right? The, all the newspapers said, you know, Swamis and his Hindu, weird Hindu love cult, right? And, it, you know, America was a very racist place back then. Uh, and in fact, even when he was in uh, uh, D.C., you know, he couldn't teach the black people in the same room as the white people. And he happened to go be in Miami when the story broke. And all the husbands in Miami wanted to basically, you know, kind of beat him up physically. And the police said, we can't have you do your talk uh, because of this. And so, you know, this scandal erupted. And then later, his number two guy, Swami Dharananda, left, took a bunch of people with him. He ended up going and getting married and becoming more of a secular guy. But anyway, Yogananda's organization fell apart and there was a lawsuit. He was suing him for half a million dollars, which think about how much money that was back then uh, compared to today. So, so his whole organization was kind of falling apart. And, you know, Yogananda was a little depressed, if, if I can use that term. Uh, but, you know, he spent 15 years building up this organization and teaching and then, you know, starting to see things unravel. He decided to take a vacation. He went to Mexico and he, uh, you know, meditated in Mexico. He also met the president of Mexico. But he meditated and he said, Lord, please, this is too hard teaching these Westerners yoga and our traditions. I just want to go back to India and I just want to meditate in a cave, right? That was his his dream all along was to go to the Himalayas and meditate in a cave. But, you know, eventually he realized back then earlier, you know, that gurus, uh, the mountains cannot be your guru and many unenlightened people live in the Himalayas. Uh, and he had to find, you know, whatever spiritual lessons or traditions he was looking for. And he got the message in Mexico that, no, this is your task in life, right? This is part of your karmic, your great karmic task that you have been given. And so, you know, you shouldn't go back. You need to keep going. And that was when, after that, I believe he started to look for different ways to get his message out, where he wasn't traveling all the time. So he had a smaller group of disciples, but he decided to write, uh, to write, a book and he spent like the last decade or so of his life in Encinitas, which is just outside San Diego, writing autobiography of a yogi. And you can see how that book brought together many threads of his life. If there's one thing that Yogananda was good at, it was collecting stories of swamis and who had superpowers like the tiger swami, the levitating saint, all of these. Uh, even as a kid, if there was a swami who showed any uh, you know, supernatural talents. Yogananda was there and he'd meet him and he'd spend time with him and ask him questions. He was a spiritual prodigy, but he was also uh, this guy who collected stories of swamis his entire life. Um, and then turns out that is the threads that were woven together into this book. Uh, and then, you know, he actually left the book as his legacy. So if it wasn't for that big setback, it's possible he might not have spent that decade kind of cloistered away in his hermitage and now there's a hermitage in Encinitas um, uh, that you know where he wrote the book and during uh, the writing of my book I actually went there and so it was during COVID and they wouldn't let me you know it wasn't open to the public but they they made an exception because I was writing this book so they let me go there and I spent you know basically a bunch of time with the the monastics that live there and I was in the office where Yogananda wrote uh, his book is a beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. It's overlooking a beach, which is now called Swami's Beach. And so I was able to kind of go there and just kind of meditate. And, you know, what's interesting is I was having uh, some difficulty getting started with this book because I was taking it very seriously because I had been given this serious task, right, uh, to, to write this. And, and this is another one of the lessons uh, in the book, which you can read about, which is sometimes the universe gives you a task, whether you're ready or not for that task. Uh, but uh, so I went into this meditative state. I was hearing the sound of the ocean and I had a vision of Yogananda while I was there. And it was a subjective vision for me, but I saw him in his office and he had a stack of papers with me. Uh, and of course, that's how they wrote books back then, right? They didn't have computers and you had only one copy of the manuscript. And if you lost it, that's it. Right? So he had this stack of papers, which was his book. And he kind of looked at me like, like pay attention. And then he like turned opened these French double doors that went out to the patio to the ocean. And much to my horror, he like took the book and threw all the papers off into the wind, into the Pacific Ocean. And I was like, wait, don't do that. Uh, some of you may know there's a famous scene in a in a uh, Indian movie uh, 
uh, where a guy has a manuscript that he's been writing his whole life and it, it flies off in the river. But in any case, I was really worried, but he had this mischievous glint in his eye during my vision and he kind of smiled and he said, look, and then all the pages turn into little birds that went off to different parts of the world. And he was sort of saying, okay, you're a writer. This is important to leave these words behind. They'll go out. But he also said, don't take it so seriously. Uh, there was a second message in that. And after that, you know, I didn't, I, I started to say, you know what? I like writing about yogis with superpowers. So I'm just going to do that. And the whole book flowed pretty quickly from there. And the whole book is not about yogis with superpowers, but that was a key part. And so you can see how we can use our intuition uh, to basically tap into uh, different types of, of, of energy, or in this case, you know, it was the spirit of Yogananda. I believe that I was able to tap into very, very subjectively for me. Uh, but again, uh, sometimes setbacks can be part of your path as well. And remembering that, that this may be a course correction when you have a big setback, like with Yogananda. Um, so anyway, I went a little off the, the topic there, but I thought that would be a good opportunity to tell you another story. <laughs> I think that was one of his enduring legacies is that he was really a bridge between East and West. And, you know, back then uh, when he was first going to America, now I, I said one of the lessons in, in, in the book, in my book and coming out of Yogananda's life is sometimes the universe gives you a task. Now Yogananda was not the best qualified person to represent India at this, uh, you know, Congress of World Religions, this festival that was held in Boston in 1920. And yet he got this invitation to go. And he had never given a speech in English. Right? And, you know, he was supposed to represent Hinduism at this. Conference. That's what got him here. But part of the reason and part of his life mission and why he stayed was to try to bridge this gap. And at the time he was worried, you know, uh, how will I deal with the kind of ungodly materialism of the West? right, coming from the spiritual East. That's how he called it. Now, today, I would say that things have changed so much that you will see as much materialism on the streets of, you know, Mumbai or Shanghai or Lahore or Karachi as you would in any Western city. In fact, you know, in Shanghai or Beijing, you might even see more of uh, materialism out there. And so I think what's needed is a middle ground. And, and, and Yogananda talked about this, both his guru, Sri Yukteswar, and his guru's guru, Babaji, talked about there needed to be a middle ground between the frenetic activity of the West and the spiritual traditions of the East. And now I would say there needs to be that within the East itself, right? Uh, and this started during Yogananda's time. I mean, he had many people, including you know his sister's husband, uh, Satish, who was like, why are you wasting your time with these dirty monks robes? Get a job, support your family, right? Uh, get a real job. His father wanted him to get a real job as well, right? Because you know, you know, India was modernizing. That was the period when it was modernizing. And so already, you know, some of the philosophies were being pushed into the past. But I think that uh, you know, the, the real value of this book uh, has become uh, something, uh, you know, a way to think about a middle path. And when Yogananda went back to India in 1935, you know, he would talk about, uh, you know, uh, everything he learned in America, like he had started a school uh, in a place called Ranchi, and uh, they were taking away the land. It was given by the, uh, the prince of, of that area. Um, but Yogananda said in his letter, I, I didn't spend 15 years in America building up an organization to, to not have that American can-do attitude then I'm going to go and figure out how to get funding to make this school continue to work. And of course he did, but you know, he started this campaign. But what's happened is, is what we call the pizza effect, uh, what some scholars call the pizza effect. Now pizza started in some region in Italy, right? And then it came over to the West. But what we think of as pizza is not exactly the same. It's kind of a westernized version of the pizza. But now that has gone back to Italy. And so that has become like what when you order pizza in Italy, <laughs> you get pizza that's closer to what we think of as pizza, as opposed to what the original thing was. And pizza and with Yogananda, the same thing happened where he came here, influenced a lot of people, and now, you know, his book has become quite popular in India, which is interesting that HarperCollins India asked me to write this, uh, and so you know, it's really uh, 
uh, uh, an interesting situation. But in the in the East, I think now we've adopted they've adopted so many of the Western ways, uh, and uh, you know, in a good way and a bad way. And so you know, how do you find that? And I think you know, even even within India, I mean, the book is actually sold quite well. You know, within India, and that's where it was published first before it, before it was published. You know, here in the West. And because there's, you know, an entire generation of people that are now working in the computer industry and in other industries, and there's an emerging middle class, but I think there's a need to find the balance between the two. And, you know, the, the spiritual traditions of old, perhaps modified. I mean, Yogananda was a bit of a reformer. There were a lot of people in India who did not like what he was doing, that he was teaching yogic techniques and correspondence classes and he had large classrooms and they're like, that's not how you're supposed to do yoga. That's not how it's been done for thousands of years, right? Um, and and so he was a bit of a reformer. And I think we need to find ways to bring these techniques uh, that are time tested, but we need to be able to integrate them within, within you know, the, the the modern world. And so I think, you know, he, he his book is a very important bridge and there are others as well, you know, that have done that. But, but that was part of his life's mission. Um, Well, I, you know, I'm working on a second edition of the simulation hypothesis, but uh, that won't be out for a while. Uh, that'll be, you know, out next year sometime. And uh, I'm uh, currently working on a book about virtual reality, the metaverse and science fiction is more of an academic book, but there's some science fiction stories. So that's a little less on the spiritual side. And then eventually I am working on a book about simulation and religion, which is taking the ideas from wisdom of a yogi and simulation hypothesis and broadening them out across the world scriptures, uh, including, you know, showing how these metaphors are all related to each other. Uh, and so that'll probably be called God and the simulation, but that that'll be a while before that, that book is out and ready. Uh, but I will remind people that, you know, Watkins has signed copies and I know at least one person was able to call you guys up and get you to ship to somewhere in the UK, the signed copy. So, <laughs> You know, if you guys are interested in that, call Watkins, even if you're not in London, and, and they can ship it to you. Bye, everyone.